Section 14 of The Diaries by John Evelyn, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 21st November, 1644. I was carried to see a great virtuoso, Cavaliero Porzo, who showed us a rare collection of all kind of antiquities and a choice library, of which are the effigies of most of our late men of polite literature. He had a great collection of the antique basso relievos about Rome, which this curious man had caused to be designed in several folios, many fine medals, the stone which Pliny calls in Hydros, it had plainly in it the quantity of half a spoonful of water, of a yellow pebble colour of the bigness of a walnut, a stone paler than an amethyst, which yet he affirmed with a true carbuncle, and harder than a diamond. It was set in a ring without foil or anything at the bottom, so as it was transparent of a greenish-yellow, more lustrous than a diamond. He had very pretty things painted on crimson velvet, designed in black, and shaded and heightened with white, set in frames, also a number of choice designs and drawings. Hence we walked to the Sabura and Aerarium Saturnae, where yet remain some ruins and an inscription, from thence to San Pietro in Vinculis, one of the seven churches on the Esquiline an old and much frequented place of great devotion for the relics there, especially the bodies of the seven Maccabean brethren which lie under the altar. On the wall is a San Sebastian of mosaic, after the Greek manner. But what I chiefly regarded was that noble sepulchre of Pope Julius II, the work of Michelangelo, with that never sufficiently to be admired statue of Moses, in white marble, and those of Vita Contemplativa and Activa by the same incomparable hand. To this church belongs a monastery, in the court of whose cloisters grow two tall and very stately palm trees. Behind these we walk to turn amongst the baths of Titus, admiring the strange and prodigious receptacles for water, which the vulgar call the Setisali, now all in heaps. 22nd November 1644 was the solemn and greatest ceremony of all the state ecclesiastical, viz. the procession of the Pope Innocent X to St. John di Laterano, which, standing on the steps of Ara Chile near the capital, I saw pass in this manner. First went a guard of Switzers to make way, and divers of the avant garde of horse carrying lances. Next followed those who carried the robes of the cardinals, two and two, then the cardinals' mace-bearers. The caudatari on mules, the masters of their horses, the pope's barber, tailor, baker, gardener, and other domestic officers, all on horseback, in rich liveries. The squires belonging to the guard. Five men in rich liveries led five noble Neapolitan horses, white as snow, covered to the ground with the trappings richly embroidered, which is a service paid by the King of Spain for the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily, pretended feudatories to the Pope. Three mules of exquisite beauty and price, trapped in crimson velvet. Next followed three rich litters with mules, the litters empty the master of the horse alone with his squires, five trumpeters, the armorari extramuros, the fiscal and consistorial advocates, capellani, camerieri di honore, cubiculari and chamberlains, called secreti. Then followed four other camerieri with four caps of the dignity pontifical, which were cardinal's hats carried on staves, four trumpets, after them a number of noble Romans and gentlemen of quality, very rich, and followed by innumerable staffieri and pages, the secretaries of the Chancellaria, Abereviatori Acoliti in their long robes and on mules, Auditori di Rota, the Dean of the Roti, and the Master of the Sacred Palace on mules, with grave but rich footclothes and in flat episcopal hats. 
then went more of the Roman and other nobility and courtiers, with divers pages in most rich liveries on horseback, fourteen drums belonging to the capital, the marshals with their staves, the two syndics, the conservators of the city in robes of crimson damask, the knight Confalione and prior of the R.R. in velvet toques, six of his holiness's mace-bearers, then the captain or governor of the castle of San Angelo, upon a brave prancer, the governor of the city, on both sides of these two long ranks of Switzers, the masters of the ceremonies, the cross-bearer on horseback, with two priests in each hand on foot, pages, footmen and guards in abundance. Then came the Pope himself, carried in a little or rather open chair of crimson velvet, richly embroidered and borne by two stately mules. As he went he held up two fingers, blessing the multitude who were on their knees, or looking out of their windows and houses, with loud vivas and acclamations of felicity to their new prince. This chair would follow by the master of his chamber, cup-bearer, secretary and physician. Then came the cardinal bishops, cardinal priests, cardinal deacons, patriarchs, archbishops and bishops, all in their several and distinct habits, some in red, others in green flat hats with tassels, all on gallant mules richly trapped with velvet and led by their servants in great state and multitudes. After them the apostolical protonotari, auditor, treasurer and referendaries, Lastly, the trumpets of the rear guard, two pages of arms in helmets with feathers and carrying lances, two captains, the pontifical standard of the church, two alfieri, or cornets of the Pope's light horse, who all followed in armour and carrying lances, which, with innumerable rich coaches, litters and people, made up the procession. What they did at St. John de Laterano I could not see, by reason of the prodigious crowd, so I spent most of the day in viewing the two triumphal arches which had been purposely erected a few days before, until now covered, the one by the Duke of Parma in the Foro Romano, the other by the Jews in the capital, with flattering inscriptions. They were of excellent architecture, decorated with statues and abundance of ornaments proper for the occasion, since they were but temporary and made up of boards, cloth, etc., painted and framed on the sudden, but as to outward appearance, solid and very stately. The night ended with fireworks. What I saw was that which was built before the Spanish ambassador's house in the Piazza del Trinita, and another before that of the French. The first appeared to be a mighty rock, bearing the Pope's arms, a dragon, and diverse figures, which were being set on fire by one who flung a rocket at it, kindled immediately, yet preserving the figure both of the rock and statues a very long time. Insomuch as it was deemed ten thousand, reports of squibs and crackers spent themselves in order. That before the French ambassador's palace was a Diana, drawn in a chariot by her dogs, with abundance of other figures as large as the life, which played with fire in the same manner. In the meantime, the windows of the whole city were set with tapers put into lanterns or sconces of several coloured oiled paper, that the wind might not annoy them. This rendered a most glorious show. Besides these, there were at least twenty other fireworks of vast charge and rare art for their invention, before diverse ambassadors, princes and cardinals' palaces, especially that on the castle of San Angelo, being a pyramid of lights of great height, fastened to the ropes and cables which support the standard pole. The streets were this night as light as day, full of bonfires, cannon roaring, music playing, fountains running wine, in all excess of joy and triumph. 23rd November 1644 I went to the Jesuits' college again, the front whereof gives place to few for its architecture, most of its ornaments being of rich marble. It has within a noble portico and court, sustained by stately columns, as is the corridor over the portico, 
at the sides of which are the schools for arts and sciences, which are here taught as at the university. Here I heard Father Athanasius Kircher upon a part of Euclid which he expounded. To this joins a glorious and ample church for the students. A second is not fully finished. And there are two noble libraries where I was showed that famous wit and historian, Famianus Strada. Hence we went to the house of Hippolito Vitelesco, afterwards bibliothecary of the Vatican Library, who showed us one of the best collections of statues in Rome, to which he frequently talks as if they were living, pronouncing now and then orations, sentences and verses, sometimes kissing and embracing them. He has a head of Brutus scarred in the face by order for the Senate for killing Julius. This is much esteemed also Minerva and others of great value. The gentleman not long since purchased land in the kingdom of Naples in hope, by digging the ground, to find more statues, which it seems so far succeeded as to be much more worth than the purchase. We spent the evening at the Chiesa Nova, where was excellent music, but before that began, the courteous fathers led me into a nobly furnished library contiguous to their most beautiful convent. 28th November 1644 I went to see the garden and house of the Aldo Brandini, now Cardinal Borghese's. This palace is for architecture, magnificence, pomp and state, one of the most considerable about the city. It has four fronts and a noble piazza before it. Within the courts, under arches supported by marble columns, are many excellent statues. Ascending the stairs, there is a rare figure of Diana, of white marble. The St. Sebastian and Hermaphrodite are of stupendous art. For paintings, our Saviour's head by Correggio, several pieces of Raphael, some of which are small, some of Bassano Veronese, the Leda, and two admiral venuses are of titian's pencil so is the psyche and cupid the head of st john borne by herodias two heads of albert durer very exquisite we were shown here a fine cabinet and tables of florence work in stone in the garden are many fine fountains the walls covered with citron trees which being rarely spread invest the stonework entirely and towards the street at a back gate, the port is so handsomely clothed with ivy as much pleased me. About this palace are many noble antique bassi relievi, two especially are placed on the ground, representing armour and other military furniture of the Romans. Beside these stand about the garden numerous rare statues, altars and urns. Above all, for antiquity and curiosity, as being the only rarity of that nature now known to remain, is that piece of old Roman painting representing the Roman sponsalia, or celebration of their marriage, judged to be 1,400 years old. It are the colours very lively, and the design very entire, though found deep in the ground. For this morsel of painting's sake only, it is said the Borghese purchased the house, because this being on a wall in a kind of banqueting house in the garden could not be removed, but passes with the inheritance. 29th November 1644 I a second time visited the Medician Palace, being near my lodging, the more exactly to have a view of the noble collections that adorn it, especially the bassi relievi and the antique friezes inserted about the stonework of the house. The satin of metal, standing in the portico, is a rare piece, so is the Jupiter and Apollo in the hall. We were now led into those rooms above we could not see before, full of incomparable statues and antiquities. Above all, and happily preferable to any in the world, are the two wrestlers, for the inextricable mixture with each other's arms and legs is stupendous. In the great chamber is the gladiator, wetting a knife. But the Venus is without parallel, being the masterpiece of one whose name we see graven under it in all Greek characters. 
nothing in sculpture ever approached this miracle of art. To this add Marcius Ganymede, a little Apollo playing on a pipe, some relievi encrusted on the palace walls, and an antique vase of marble near six feet high. Among the pictures may be mentioned the Maudlin and St. Peter weeping. I pass over the cabinets and tables of Pietro Comessa, being the proper invention of the Florentines. In one of the chambers is a whimsical chair, which folded into so many varieties as to turn into a bed, a bolster, a table or a couch. I had another walk in the garden, where are two huge vases or baths of stone. I went further up the hill to the Pope's palaces at Monte Cavallo, where I now saw the garden more exactly, and found it to be one of the most magnificent and pleasant in Rome. I am told the garden is annually allowed two thousand scudi for the keeping of it. Here I observed hedges of myrtle above a man's height, others of laurel, oranges, nay of ivy and juniper, the close walks and rustic grotto, a crypt of which the lava or basin is of one vast entire antique porphyry, and below this flows a plentiful cascade, the steps of the grotto and the roofs being of rich mosaic. Here are hydraulic organs, a fish pond, and an ample bath. From hence we went to taste some rare Greco, and so home. Being now pretty weary of continual walking, I kept within for the most part till the 6th of December, and during this time I entertained one Signor Alessandro, who gave me some lessons on the Theorbo. The next excursion was over the Tiber, which I crossed in a ferry-boat to see the Palazzo di Gizzi standing in Trastevere, fairly built, but famous only for the painting a fresco on the volto of the portico toward the garden. The story is the amours of Cupid and Psyche, by the hand of the celebrated Raphael d'Urbino. Here you always see painters designing and copying after it, being esteemed one of the rarest pieces of that art in the world, and with great reason. I must not omit that incomparable table of Galatea, as I remember, so carefully preserved in the cupboard at one of the ends of the walk, to protect it from the air, being a most lively painting. There are likewise excellent things of Baldassari and others. Thence we went to the noble house of the Duke of Bracciano, fairly built, with a stately court and fountain. Next we walked to St Mary's Church, where was the Taberna Meritoria, where the old Roman soldiers received their triumphant garland, which they ever after wore. The high altar is very fair, adorned with columns of porphyry. Here is also some mosaic work about the choir, and the Assumption is an esteemed piece. It is said that this church was the first that was dedicated to the Virgin at Rome. In the opposite piazza is a very sumptuous fountain. 12th December 1644 I went again to St Peter's to see the chapels, churches and grots under the whole church, like our St Faith's under Paul's, in which lie interred a multitude of saints, martyrs and popes, among them our countryman Adrian the Fourth, Nicholas Breakspear, in a chest of porphyry, Sir J. Chrysostom, Petronella, the heads of St. James Minor, St. Luke, St. Sebastian, and our Thomas of Becket, a shoulder of St. Christopher, an arm of Joseph of Arimathea, Longinus, besides 134 more bishops, soldiers, princes, scholars, cardinals, kings, emperors, their wives, too long to particularise. Hence we walked into the cemetery called Campo Santo, the earth consisting of several shiploads of mould transported from Jerusalem, which consumes a carcass in 24 hours. To this joins that rare hospital where once was Nero's circus. The next to this is the Inquisition House and prison, the inside whereof, I thank God, I was not curious to see. To this joins His Holiness's horse guards. 
On Christmas Eve I went not to bed, being desirous of seeing the many extraordinary ceremonies performed then in their churches, at midnight masses and sermons. I walked from church to church the whole night in admiration at the multitude of scenes and pageantry which the friars had with much industry and craft set out to catch the devout women and superstitious sort of people who never parted without dropping some money into a vessel set on purpose. But especially observable was the puppetry in the church of the Minerva representing the nativity. I thence went and heard a sermon at the Apollinare, by which time it was morning. On Christmas Day his Holiness sang mass, the artillery of St. Angelo went off, and all this day was exposed the cradle of our Lord. 29th December 1644 We were invited by the English Jesuits to dinner, being their great feast of Thomas a Becket of Canterbury. We dined in their common refectory, and afterwards saw an Italian comedy acted by their alumni before the cardinals. January 1645 We saw pass the new officers of the people of Rome. Especially for their noble habits were most conspicuous the three consuls, now called conservatores who take their places in the capital, having been sworn the day before, between the hands of the Pope. We ended the day with the rare music at the Chiesa Nova. 6th January 1645 was the ceremony of our Saviour's baptism in the church of St. Athanasius, and at Aricelli was a great procession, del Bambino as they call it, where were all the magistrates and a wonderful concourse of people. 7th January 1645 A sermon was preached to the Jews at Pontisisto, who were constrained to sit till the hour is done, but is with so much malice in their countenances, spitting, humming, coughing and motion, that it is almost impossible they should hear a word from the preacher. A conversion is very rare. 14th January 1645 the heads of St. Peter and St. Paul are exposed at St. John Laterano. 15th January 1645, the titel or young wenches, which are to have portions given them by the Pope, being poor, and to marry them, walked in procession to St. Peter's, where the Veronica was shown. I went to the ghetto where the Jews dwell, as in a suburb by themselves being invited by a Jew of my acquaintance to see a circumcision. I pass by the Piazza Judea, where their seraglio begins, for, being environed with walls, they are locked up every night. In this place remains yet part of a stately fabric, which my Jew told me had been a palace of theirs for the ambassador of their nation, when their country was subject to the Romans. Being led through the synagogue into a private house, I found a world of people in a chamber. By and by came an old man who prepared and laid in order diverse instruments brought by a little child of about seven years old in a box. These the man laid in a silver basin. The knife was much like a short razor to shut into the half. Then they burnt some incense in a censer which perfumed the room all the while the ceremony was performing. In the basin was a little cap made of wide paper like a capuchin's hood, not bigger than the finger, also a paper of a red astringent powder, I suppose of bole. A small instrument of silver cleft in the middle at one end to take up the prepuce with all. A fine linen cloth wrapped up. These being all in order, the women brought the infant swaddled out of another chamber and delivered it to the rabbi, who carried and presented it before an altar or cupboard, dressed up, on which lay the five books of Moses and the commandments a little unrolled. Before this, with profound reverence and mumbling a few words, he waved the child to and fro a while, 
Then he delivered it to another rabbi who sat all this time upon a table. While the ceremony was performing, all the company fell singing a Hebrew hymn in a barbarous tone, waving themselves to and fro, a ceremony they observe in all their devotions. The Jews in Rome all wear yellow hats, live only upon brokage and usury, very poor and despicable beyond what they are in other territories of princes where they are permitted. 18th January 1645 I went to see the Pope's palace, the Vatican, where he, for the most part, keeps his court. It was first built by Pope Symmachus, and since augmented to a vast pile of building by his successors. That part of it added by Sextus V is most magnificent. This leads us into diverse terraces, arch sub dio, painted by Raphael, with the histories of the Bible, so esteemed, that artists come from all parts of Europe to make their studies from these designs. The foliage and grotesque about some of the compartments are admirable. In another room are represented at large maps and plots of most countries in the world, in vast tables, with brief descriptions. The stairs which ascend out of St Peter's portico into the first hall are rarely contrived for ease. These lead into the hall of Gregory the Thirteenth, the walls whereof, halfway to the roof, are encrusted with most precious marbles of various colours and works. So is also the pavement inlaid work. But what exceeds description is the volta or roof itself, which is so exquisitely painted that it is almost impossible for the skilfullest eyes to discern whether it be the work of the pencil upon a flat or of a tool cut deep in stone. The ruta dentata, in this admirable perspective on the left hand as one goes out, the satella, etc., are things of art incomparable. Certainly this is one of the most superb and royal apartments in the world, much too beautiful for a guard of gigantic Switzers who do nothing but drink and play at cards in it. Going up these stairs is a painting of St. Peter walking on the sea toward our Saviour. Out of this I went into another hall just before the chapel called the Sala del Conclave, full of admirable paintings, among others is the assassination of Coligny, the great Protestant French admiral murdered by the Duke of Guise in the Parisian massacre at the nuptials of Henry IV with Queen Margaret. Under it is written Caligny et Sociorum Cades. On the other side, Rex Colligi Necem Probat. There is another very large picture under which is inscribed Alexander Papa III, Frederici Primi Imperatoris Eram, et impetum fugiens, abdidit se venetis cognitum et arsenatu per orofice susceptum, ottone imperatoris filio navali prelio victo captoc, Fredericus pace facta suplex adorat, fidem et abidientiam policitus ita pontifici sua dignitas venet, Re Beneficio Restituta MCL XXV123. This inscription I the rather took notice of because Urban the Eighth had caused it to be blotted out during the difference between him and that state, but it was now restored and refreshed by his successor to the great honour of the Venetians. The Battle of Lepanto is another fair piece here. Now we came into the Pope's chapel, so much celebrated for the last judgment painted by Michelangelo Buonarroti. It is a painting in fresco upon a dead wall at the upper end of the chapel, just over the high altar, of a vast design and miraculous fancy, considering the multitude of naked figures and variety of posture. The roof also is full of rare work. Hence we went into the Sacristia, where were showed all the most precious vestments, copes, and furniture of the chapel. One priestly cope, 
with the whole suite, has been sent from one of our English Henrys and is shown for a great rarity. There were divers of the Pope's pontoufle that are kissed on his foot, having rich jewels embroidered on the instep, covered with crimson velvet, also his tiara or triple crown, divers mitres, crozier, etc., all bestudded with precious stones, gold and pearl, to a very great value. A very large cross carved, as they affirm, out of the holy wood itself. Numerous utensils of crystal, gold, agate, amber, and other costly materials for the altar. We then went into those chambers painted with the histories of the burning of Rome, quenched by the procession of a crucifix. The victory of Constantine over Maxentius, St. Peter's delivery out of prison, all by Giulio Romano, and are therefore called the Painter's Academy, because you always find some young men or other designing from them, a civility which is not refused in Italy, where any rare pieces of the old and best masters are extant, and which is the occasion of breeding up many excellent men in that profession. The Sala Clementina Sufito is painted by Cherubin Alberti with an ample landscape of Paul Brills. We were then conducted into a new gallery whose sides were painted with views of the most famous places, towns and territories in Italy, rarely done, and upon the roof of the chief acts of the Roman church since St Peter's pretended see there. It is doubtless one of the most magnificent galleries in Europe. Out of this we came into the consistory, a noble room, the Volta painted in grotesque, as I remember. At the upper end is an elevated throne and a baldachin, or canopy of state, for his holiness over it. From thence, through a very long gallery, longer, I think, than the French kings at the Louvre, but only of bare walls, we were brought into the Vatican Library. This passage was now full of poor people, to each of whom, in his passage to St. Peter's, the Pope gave a mezzo grosse. I believe they were in number near 1,500 or 2,000 persons. This library is the most nobly built, furnished and beautified of any in the world, ample, stately, light and cheerful, looking into a most pleasant garden. The walls and roof are painted not with antiques and grotesques like our Bodleian at Oxford, but emblems, figures, diagrams, and the like learned inventions found out by the wit and industry of famous men, of which there are now whole volumes extant. There were likewise the effigies of the most illustrious men of letters and fathers of the church, with diverse noble statues in white marble at the entrance, viz. Hippolytus and Aristides. The general councils are painted on the side walls. As to the ranging of the books, they are all shut up in presses of wainscot and not exposed on shelves to the open air nor the most precious mixed among the more ordinary, which are showed to the curious only. Such are those two Virgils written on parchment, of more than a thousand years old. The like are Terence, the Acts of the Apostles in golden capital letters, Petrarch's epigrams written with his own hand, also a Hebrew parchment made up in the ancient manner, from whence they were first called Volumina, with the Cornua, but what we English do much inquire after, the book which our Henry VIII writ against Luther. The largest room is one hundred paces long. At the end is the gallery of printed books, then the gallery of the Duke of Urban's library, in which are manuscripts of a remarkable miniature and diverse Chinese, Mexican, Samaritan, Abyssinian and other Oriental books. In another wing of the edifice, two hundred paces long, were all the books taken from Heidelberg, of which the learned Gruter and other great scholars had been keepers. These walls and volte are painted with representations of the machines invented by Domenico Fontana for erection of the obelisks and the true design of Mohammed's sepulchre at Mecca. 
Out of this we went to see the conclave, where, during a vacancy, the cardinals are shut up till they are agreed upon a new election, the whole manner whereof was described to us. Hence we went into the Pope's armoury under the library. Over the door is this inscription, Urbanus eight, Literis Arma, Arma Literis. I hardly believe any prince in Europe is able to show a more completely furnished library of Mars for the quality and quantity which is 40,000 complete for horse and foot and neatly kept. Out of this we passed again by the long gallery and at the lower end of it down a very large pair of stairs round without any steps as usually but descending with an evenness so ample and easy that a horse litter or coach may with ease be drawn up the sides of the vacuity are set with columns those at amboise on the loire in france are something of this invention but nothing so spruce by these we descended into the vatican gardens called belvedere where entering first into a kind of court we were showed those incomparable statues so famed by pliny and others of laocoon with his three sons embraced by a huge serpent all of one entire parian stone very white and perfect somewhat bigger than the life the work of those three celebrated sculptors agassandrus polydorus and artemidorus rhodians it was found among the ruins of Titus's baths and placed here. Pliny says this statue is to be esteemed before all pictures and statues in the world, and I am of his opinion, for I never beheld anything of art approach it. Here are also those two famous images of Nilus with the children playing about him, and that of Tiber, Romulus and Remus with the wolf, the dying Cleopatra, the Venus and Cupid, rare pieces, the Mercury, Sibyl, Hercules, Apollo, Antinous, most of which are for defence against the weather, shut up in niches with wainscot doors. We were likewise showed the relics of the Hadrian Moles, viz. the pine, a vast piece of metal which stood on the summit of that mausoleum, also a peacock of copper, supposed to have been part of Scipio's monument. In the garden without this, which contains a vast circuit of ground, are many stately fountains, especially two casting water into antique lavers brought from Titus's baths, some fair grots and waterworks, that noble cascade where the ship dances, with diverse other pleasant inventions, walks, terraces, meanders, fruit trees, and a most goodly prospect over the greatest part of the city. One fountain under the gate I must not omit, consisting of three jettos of water gushing out of the mouths of Proboscides of bees, the arms of the late Pope, because of the inscription Quid miraris apem quae mel de floribus haurit, si tibi melitam guteri fundit aquam. End of section 14